understand or just to define this counterparty uh, creditors, let's say A and B have got into some kind of a transaction where A will be uh, paying something to B and getting something else from B. Now, if one party fails up to meet the obligation, if this party has met the obligation but this party did not meet the obligation, then A is exposed to counterparty credit risk. Means the risk that your counterparty is not adhering to the obligation. That is what uh, we define as counterparty credit risk. Means the counterparty is defaulting. So why not it be called as the typical default risk itself or typical lending risk? What we see in these kind of stuff is in a typical default or in a typical lending risk. Okay, let's say A has given a loan to B and B fails to pay back that loan. So, the risk is not existing with B in this transaction because he has already received the money from A. Now, the entire risk rise only with A. What if B does not pay back to me? What if B defaults on the loan? So, when we talk about the typical lending risk, we see that it exists only with one party. Means the lending risk is generally unilateral in nature. Whereas when we talk about a counterparty credit risk, A should feel that B may default, B should feel that A may default. So both the parties are exposed to this because uh, in future we don't know either A might be beneficial means B will default or B might be beneficial means A will default. So both of them are exposed to this counterparty credit risk. So that's where we see that the counterparty credit risk is more bilateral in nature where something is expected from both the parties in a future day. That is one major difference and generally uh, it is associated with let's say a series of transactions. So let's say A and B have got into a, a transaction agreement for a two year period that every three months or six months A will give something to B and B will give something else to A. Now it may so happen that after six months there is a defaulting from one of the parties. Means all these will not be any more applicable. So when we are talking about uh, this agreement, it is for a two-year period, but the default has occurred somewhere in the middle before the entire thing is settled. That's where, to a large extent, we see counterparty credit risks occurring in the pre-settlement phase, and that's where we associate them to pre-settlement risk to a large extent. Though it may occur even on this day also, which is when it is uh, called as a settlement risk. But in terms of volumes, we see that counterparty credit risk is much more heavier when in the pre-settlement uh, phase itself. And typically, we see this counterparty credit risk with respect to the derivatives transactions where uh, at a future date, both the parties have some kind of uh, obligations present and any party can default at a future date. So we see these kind of counterparty credit risks very heavily with respect to the derivatives transactions and even with respect to security financing. I'll talk about uh, how the counterparty credit risk exists in these two kind of mechanisms slightly uh, after a couple of minutes. But just looking at uh, a few more important aspects of counterparty risk versus lending risk. In lending risk, one party has lent something to other. Now, what he has to get from the other party at various points in time is almost known with 
a large amount of certainty unless it's a floating rate kind of a loan. If it is a fixed rate loan, to a large extent it is known how much will come from the other party. But when we typically talk about uh, a 